Uh, good evening. My name is Bob Luck. I'm the president of the Twin Cities Chapter of Trout Unlimited. And I'd like to welcome you to our February chapter meeting. Before introducing our guest speaker, I'd like to make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, so that we can get to know each other a little bit better, if you do have a pseudonym on your screen name, if you could please change it to your real name, that would be great. So I think right now, for example, my name says Twin Cities Trout Unlimited, and I'm going to change that to Bob Luck. So if you know how to do that and you could change your name, that'd be great. I, the second thing that I want to tell you is that we are going to be holding a drawing tonight. I, the winner of the drawing, which is open to all folks who participate in this meeting tonight, uh, is going to receive a box of 48 flies hand tied by master fly tire of Paul Johnson, the proprietor of the Walconia Fly Tying Company. We'll notify the winner after the meeting ends. I would like to welcome anybody who's joining our meeting for the first time. Let's see here. I. And uh, I'd like to explain just uh, for a few minutes, uh, in case you are new, what Trout Unlimited is all about. Uh, so our mission is to conserve, protect, restore, and sustain cold water fisheries, their watersheds and groundwater sources. And we focus on the Twin Cities metro area, uh, which means that we work throughout Minnesota with other chapters in Minnesota. And we also do some work with our friends in Western Wisconsin, such as Casey. Uh, we really focus on four key areas. We advocate for sensible policies in terms of groundwater, pollution, uh, conservation. Uh, we work on habitat improvement projects. That project you see right there is some guys taking a big tree out of Hay Creek. Uh, it improves the flow of the water and makes it easier to fish. Uh, we're very involved with engagement with our members in the community. That photo you see on the lower left was a fishing camp that we did down at Whitewater State Park in uh, December. Uh, we do a lot of fishing events, chapter meetings, and so forth. And finally, we do a lot of education, in particular youth education. So these are really the areas uh, where we're uh, heavily involved. I, and I should say that of all the areas that we're involved in, for our chapter, the most important one might actually be education and youth education. Uh, in the Twin Cities metro area, we actually have some amazingly good trout streams, but we don't have nearly as many trout streams as they have down in southeastern Minnesota or over in western Wisconsin. Uh, but we, what we do have is we have a lot of people and we have a lot of kids. Uh, and you probably heard uh, that we worked last fall to raise money uh, to support increased involvement by trout in the classroom in, in uh, schools to not just uh, do the, uh, the scientific part of it, but also to work with kids on tying flies and teaching them how to fish and so forth. And we've kicked off a fly tying program. And for the month of March, we're actually going to be doing 12 events where trout in the classroom paid staff will go in and teach kids how to tie flies. And we're looking for three participants per event to help those uh, staff uh, teach the kids how to tie flies and get things set up, uh, get things taken down and so forth. Uh, personally, I haven't tied flies since I was in high school, but I have been involved in a couple of these classroom events. And if you have any knowledge of fly tying whatsoever, uh, you can really be helpful to these kids and it's a lot of fun. Uh, so I hope that uh, those of you are, who are on this call, particularly if you like kids or you like tying flies, will consider participating in one of these events. Uh, and you can find all of those events on our website, www.twincitiestu.org. Uh, you can find the events calendar and click on any event that you like. 
and you will uh, come to an events registration page, just like the page that you uh, use to sign up for the chapter meeting tonight. Uh, so I hope that uh, uh, you'll consider that and we can really work with a lot of kids to um, introduce them to the joy of trout, of fishing, and particularly of tying flies. So uh, anyway, I'm just about ready to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Casey. But before I do, I just want to um, I, I clarify how the presentation may go tonight. Uh, I'm sure there's gonna to be tons of questions for Casey. And in order to get to as many questions as possible without interrupting the flow of the presentation, we'd like to request that all of you that are uh, dialing in by Zoom, uh, that you put your questions in the chat. If you have just some urgent question that can't wait, of course, you can uh, can speak up and, and ask the question right there. But otherwise, uh, Casey's got, you know, she's going to finish in plenty of time to get to your questions. So if you put the questions in the chat, uh, then I will read those questions to Casey and she will answer them. Uh, and then once we finish all the questions in the chat, uh, we do have a, a few folks here in the live audience. Uh, if you folks want to ask your questions after that, if you can hold your questions until the chat questions are finished, that's fine, or that would be great. Um, and uh, I think that uh, uh, that way we'll be able to, 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 to get through all the questions that folks have. Uh, a couple of other reminders. Uh, we do have a pretty large group tonight. Uh, so to ensure a smooth presentation, I'm going to ask you all to turn off your microphone uh, during the presentation. Uh, and uh, if you do have a mobile phone, uh, the in-person participants, please make sure that it's silenced. Okay, so now without further ado, let me introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Casey Yalali started with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources as a senior fisheries biologist in 2018 in the Baldwin office. Her area of coverage includes St. Croix, Pierce, and Western Dunn counties. Some of the larger trout streams that she manages that you might be familiar with are the Rush, the Kinnikinnick, the Willow, and the Ogali. Before coming to Wisconsin, she got a master's degree at Southern Illinois and before that, she worked in Northern Idaho as a fisheries technician. Uh, she uh, really has a lot of experience working with both warm water and cold water fish. And she also likes to get out and participate in habitat projects. This is uh, not a terribly good photograph, but uh, we took this picture on Saturday out on the Kinney. There was a kayak to wish work day and Casey is the one about a third of the way from the left. She's wearing the camel pants. I guess that's how you can tell. Which <laughs> one is. It's a fashion statement, I think. <laughs> They're just my old ratty pants. <laughs> <laughs> Something you don't mind getting some, some, some cinders on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, now, before I embarrass you or myself any further, <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm not going to turn it over to you, Casey. Okay, sounds good. I will attempt to share my screen. This one. Okay, presentation mode. Okay, oh no, I'm at the end. Sorry. There we go. Okay, can you guys see that okay and hear me okay? Awesome. Okay, so. Thanks for the introduction, Bob. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys again and have me back. Um, so I'm gonna talk about something a little more specific than I normally talk about rather than just tell you guys all the trout numbers and where we found you know, eat the numbers of trout in each of the streams. But if you guys do have questions about that, feel free um, to throw them in the chat or email me, I'll put my email up at the end and I can send you um, our previous year's um, trout sampling results from all the streams. So, so today or tonight, I'm gonna talk to you guys um, about some changes um, that have been occurring that we've detected in several of our trout streams across my management area. Um, and these changes have um, occurred within 
um, several streams and species dominance in these streams, um, trout species dominance in particular with brook trout and brown trout have changed pretty dramatically following some disturbances that's occurred in these streams. So this is just a quick rundown of what I'm going to kind of get through in my presentation. Um, first, I'm going to talk about our current management goals in the area and across most of the state with the two main trout species that we manage, um, brooks and browns. I'm going to talk about some trends in trout species changes or lack of changes in some of our streams that we've been uh, monitoring talk about some reasons that these changes might be occurring, um, and then some factors may be influencing this, um, and then some management actions that we are taking um, to try to either combat or resist these changes in some cases. So current management goals within my management area in a lot of the state um, is in streams that have dominant or once dominant brook trout populations and streams that have the potential to hold brook trout into the future. Um, our goal is to manage and promote the brook trout population by using different habitat techniques and stocking changes. Um, it's also a goal to try to reduce brown trout densities in these streams. These are, and I wanna clarify, um, that this is only in streams that have these two bullet points that I just talked about. So streams that have the potential to hold brook trout into the future, um, the Wisconsin DNR has identified certain streams um, that have different characteristics that will allow them to hold brook trout into the future given a warming climate. So um, that's a whole nother story, but I have several of those streams in my area that have that or should have that ability um, and we're focusing this just on streams um, that were that are brown trout dominant um, and have very low or no brown trout in them um, that have that are brook trout dominant. Sorry. Um, so that's basically um, our management goals for these particular streams um, that have brook trout or once had brook trout dominant populations. So. This is basically because brook trout are only native um, and indigenous trout species, um, inland Wisconsin um, and Minnesota. Um, brown trout are not native, although they've been naturalized and they're here to stay. Um, in fact, in a lot of streams, we may only have brown trout um, in the mid century. So we're definitely still managing for brown trout in some other streams. Um, and some of these brook trout populations that I'm going to talk about have been genetically tested um, as wild Wisconsin strain brook trout, um, which means they have not been influenced by hatchery genetics and they are um, wild and feral. Um, so some of these streams, like I said, they will hold brook trout into the future. Um, so we're going to continue to manage and promote both species in single species streams or brown trout dominant streams, but this is just um, a few of the reasons why managing these brook trout populations that we still have is so important. So in my management area and um, some other biologist management areas, um, we've detected some changes in the species dominance in these streams. Um, so several of these streams um, have changed relatively recently, um, which means in the past decade or two, so the past 20 years or less. Um, these are generally streams in Pierce County. Um, they've changed from once brook trout dominant streams um, to now brown trout dominant streams, which basically means brown trout have much higher abundances and are just the dominant um, trout in these streams now. Um, so this has resulted in extreme declines in the brook trout populations within these streams that were once strong populations. Um, and this has also resulted in extreme increases in brown trout abundances within these streams, which I'll get into how extreme these changes have been. So I'm just gonna show you several streams here. You don't have to get into the graphs too much, um, but basically what I want you to take away. So this is the first example that I'm gonna show where we've detected um, this change in species dominance. So previously, this is Pine Creek. It's way down in um, Southeastern 
Pierce County. Um, if you guys are familiar with it, it has, it's had a lot of habitat work done on it. It's by Maiden Rock, Wisconsin. It's pretty small, um, but it's one of the coldest stream. It is the coldest stream in my management area. Um, previously, this was strictly a brook trout stream. You can see on this graph, brook trout are in the green. This is just abundance each year from the year 2000 to 2021. So brook trout are green, brown trout are the rust color. Um, and you can see brook trout, you know, pretty much the dominant species all the way up until about 2012. And then in 2006, though, brown trout did start to show up. Um, and it took them a little bit to get established. But once they did in about 2012, 2013, their numbers surpassed brook trout and this past year in 2021, there were 10,000 brown trout per mile, um, which was really insane. Um, crazy the number of brown trout in there. Um, so now brown trout are obviously very dominant species and brook trout have basically dwindled down to very low numbers. Um, I just threw this graph of temperature up here. Pine Creek, like I said, very, very cold, probably the coldest in my area. And stream temperatures, um, if anything, have gotten slightly colder since um, 1970. So Parker Creek is another one where this change has occurred. Once brook trout dominant, now it's um, mostly brown trout with very few brook trout left. Um, same kind of graph here, brook trout are blue, brown trout are the rust color, and you can see their abundances throughout the years. And now brown trout, um, they're the dominant species and have been since um, for a very long time in this stretch, actually. I threw up another graph here. Um, yeah, Casey, sorry. Sorry, yeah. just to nerd out is CPE, is that catch oh. for effort or what is Yes, that? sorry, I should have... Um, explain the graphs. Yes, catch per effort. So it's basically number per mile um, of trout. Um, good call, Bob. So yeah, that's that's the way we um, measure relative abundance or trout densities in the stream. So it's number of fish per mile. This is total per mile. Um, so the right hand graph is a control is our what we use as our control site here. Um, because the, um, the other site actually had habitat work done and the control site has not. So you can see there, brook trout um, are present 1996, about even with brown trout, um, but actually now brook trout are the dominant species um, in the 2015 survey, um, which is total opposite from what happened um, a little further downstream in Parker Creek. Um, Parker Creek's temperature stayed relatively stable um, throughout the years. Um, there was a spike in temperatures around the 2012, 2013, but other than that, pretty stable temperatures in Parker. Katy Creek is another one that this has happened. I'm not gonna get into too much detail because this is just, this is the trend that we're seeing in some of these streams. So similar deal, brook trout are the red lines and brown trout are the blue colors flip now, but you can see brook trout were the only species present in Katy for historically the only species present. Um, so this just shows from 1998 to 2021, brook trout have been on, um, were relatively stable. This is the left, left side graph. Um, and then in about 2010 on this graph, you can see some brown trout starting to show up um, and their numbers just increased from there. And now they're the dominant species in this particular site. It's actually a little worse if you go downstream from where we took this data. Brown trout um, numbers are extremely high or were extremely high. We're doing some management actions here to try to combat that, but much worse situation a little bit downstream. And you can see here, I've got a control site where um, no habitat work or any other disturbances have occurred. Um, on the right side, the purple, there's only brook trout at this site and their numbers fluctuated through time, but they're very strong here. This is another site, just wanted to throw up there, no habitat work or any kind of disturbance has been, um, has occurred at this site on Plum Creek. This is in Southern Pierce County. Um, and you can see brook trout here are green, brown trout are rust, um, and brook trout were once dominant and now are in very low numbers and brown trout are the highly dominant species here. So, so we see this trend in all of these streams occurring. 
This is Plum Creek in Crawford County. Just another example, I'm not gonna get into the graph because it's basically the same thing that I've showed you um, in these other streams that now brown trout are the dominant species when brook trout once were. So why is this, why are these changes happening? Why are brown trout um, increasing in abundance while brook trout um, are declining? Is it, um, is it habitat work? Is it droughts or something extreme happening um, with the environmental factors? Um, is it a general rise in temperature? Um, so basically, I'm gonna get into that in a little bit, but I wanna take you back to what's happening in some other streams. Um, in some other streams that have undergone some similar disturbances um, like habitat work, um, as what's been done in Pine and Katy. Um, in some other streams where habitat work has also been done, the species dominance has remained the same. So brook trout were the dominant species and they still are. Um, this is Gilbert Creek. There's a lot of blue here. The blue is all brook trout. You can see brook trout have remained the dominant species. Brown trout are present and have always been present in low numbers and still are, um, which is pretty interesting. So this is Gilbert Creek in Western Dunn County. This is Wilson Creek, um, a little bit south of, or a little bit north of Gilbert, Western Dunn County, similar area. Habitat work's also been completed on a couple sites. And basically what I want you to take away from these graphs, because there's a lot here, bro the brook trout numbers are in green, brown trout are in rust, and you can see brook brown trout have always been present in low numbers, but have never became the dominant species here and are still in low numbers here. So what's the difference with these streams where we're seeing these changes from brook trout to brown trout? Um, and then in other streams, we're seeing um, brook trout remain as the dominant species. So why, why are these changes occurring in some and not in others? So why might these changes be occurring? Why are brown trout able to take advantage and become the dominant species in some of these streams? Um, so brown, some of the, some potential factors are likely that brown trout generally live longer, they reach larger sizes, they're more fecund, meaning they reproduce, um, they're, they have, um, they're able to um, carry more eggs and spawn more effectively. Um, they're a more tolerant species, they can take advantage of a wider range of environmental variables, including a little bit poorer water quality, um, some higher temperature um, fluctuations and maximums. Um, Brown trout um, can exclude brook trout from optimal resting and foraging habitats. Um, this has been well documented in the literature and other studies. Um, and some other studies have actually found that brook trout have lost weight and became more susceptible to disease in the presence of brown trout in some lab trials. Um, and some other studies have found that the presence of brown trout can change or influence the behavior of brook trout. And brown trout have actually replaced brook trout in other streams um, as well across the country. This has been well documented. So why might this be happening? Um, and why is there this dramatic difference in how these streams um, are reacting? Um, so I'm just gonna talk about specifically my area of management um, and just some potential influences on these changes. So I'm gonna get into, um, the differences in the bedrock geology, so sandstone versus dolomite, um, because as you'll see here in this slide, so this is Pierce County, the blue and the dark blue is dolomite or limestone based geology. I'm not a geologist, but um, this is a pretty dramatic difference in these two um, in these two counties and these two areas that these changes are occurring. So this is our blue, this is Pierce County. This is where we're seeing brook trout streams go to brown trout streams. Here's Western Dunn County. You can see dominated by that um, sandy yellow color, which is um, sandstone as the underlying geology. And this is where we're seeing brook trout remain as the dominant species, even while brown trout are present. So this is just zoomed in a little bit. You can see um, these two counties, the colors are different, but you can see between Pierce County in the purple and um, Dunn County in the red, the very different bedrock geology types. 
So all of these arrows here um, point to where um, the streams are located that I just talked about where we've seen these changes and where we haven't. So over here where um, the brown trout is located, if you could see my pointer, these are all, this is Parker, this is Pine Creek down at the bottom, Katie's kind of in the middle, and then Gilbert and Wilson are over here in the red by the brook trout. So these are where the streams are located um, in proximity to each other and where we've been seeing these changes. So what's the mechanism that causes this? So this is a theory, it hasn't been tested yet. Um, we still have a lot of exploring to do, but basically um, I'm not sure of the mechanism um, that's causing these changes or not causing them. Um, but basically in these areas that are dolomitic or limestone based um, geology, um, habitat projects or other disturbances in the streams have flipped from brook to brown, like I said. So, um, and then in areas with this sandstone bedrock type, um, brook trout have remained the dominant species despite habitat work or other things going on in the watershed. So is geology driving um, some kind of pH difference? Um, because we do know um, the pH difference that sandstone um, versus limestone um, creates is when sandstone is weathered, it creates very acidic water or acidic soils. And then when limestone is weathered or exposed, it creates slightly basic soils or water. Um, so is this um, underlying geology making, um, you know, a pH change that's favoring one species or over the other? We're not sure. There are a couple studies out there um, that have documented that in the east. Um, so um, I'm very interested to try to test some of this out and figure out exactly what's causing this um, in these areas. So basically, since we're seeing these changes, is there anything that we can do when we're doing our habitat projects um, in Pierce County with this limestone um, dominated geology where we've seen brook trout decline and brown trout increase, which is not ideal in um, these streams where we're trying to manage for brook trout. There's only a few major trout streams left in Pierce County um, that still contain brook trout populations that are still of a fishable size, um, the, a little bit bigger water that people can actually still fish. So it's really important to try to conserve these if we can. So some management implications, what can be done? What can I do? Can we change habitat practices? Can we change how we stock the streams? Um, manual removal of brown trout from these streams, um, regulation changes. Um, so we're experimenting and monitoring um, currently and kind of um, enacting several of these management um, actions. So I just wanted to get in real quick um, with some potential um, influences um, on our habitat practices that we've been um, implementing on some of our streams. So it's well documented in the literature, but there's very subtle differences in habitat with what brook trout prefer and brown trout prefer. So it's really difficult to discern or implement these and um, with the intent to increase brook trout populations and not brown trout because they're so similar. But in the literature, um, in previous studies, there's been um, substrate differences have been documented. So brook trout um, have the ability to spawn in very coarse sand or very small substrates. They prefer groundwater areas, upwelling and spring areas to spawn in, whereas brown trout prefer a little bit larger gravel and cobble substrates to spawn in. So there's a little difference there. Water velocity for spawning is also slightly different where brook trout prefer um, a little bit slower water velocities relative to brown trout when they're spawning. And there's also these pH differences that each species prefer um, that I mentioned earlier. So brook trout predominant species in areas of lower pH. This is what they found in the east. Um, so these are maybe some little um, habitat differences that we can key into when we're um, doing our habitat projects to try to focus on brook trout. So basically, right now to try to achieve some of those differences and focus on brook trout in our habitat projects, we're doing a little bit less stream narrowing to try to allow some smaller substrates um, to stay within those stretches to focus on brook trout spawning. Um, 
and that leaves a little bit slower water velocities. Um, we're creating a little bit more channel diversity, adding in islands and trying to create more small microhabitats for um, brook trout to have the potential to occupy without having to compete with browns for these optimal habitats. Um, adding in some more complex woody structure, some more root wads and fewer rock and in-stream boulders. We're not using lunker structures um, anymore in these streams. In other streams, we still are. Um, just because brown trout, a few large brown trout tend to dominate these structures um, when we're doing our surveys is what we've noticed. Um, and we're also doing some ERO structures, which a member of Kayaptoish has um, actually developed. So that's a whole another story. But if you have questions about that, let me know. Um, so basically, um, what I wanted to wanted, want you to take away from that is that the underlying geology may explain the differences in fish population responses to our habitat work or other disturbances, um, and it may change the species present. We don't know what actually is about the geology that's causing this, whether it's pH or substrate or something else, habitat in general. Um, so 2019 was our first year to implement changes in habitat techniques, and we're currently monitoring that. Um, and we're going to continue investigating these variables. So I'm going to take it one step further. I'm almost done. Um, and then I can take questions. Um, but we've one of these streams is um, that we've implemented these habitat changes um, in our habitat projects is Plum Creek. Um, it's a brook trout reserve stream, um, which means it will likely have the ability to hold brook trout into the future. Um, it's our first stream that we've did these project that we've did this type of project on. Both species were present prior to the project um, and brown trout were actually the dominant species before the project at about 75% browns, 24% brooks. So basically the question here is can we alter habitat to favor brook trout? Um, so with this was such a long habitat project. It was 10,000 feet in length. I divided it into three sections um, and we did a little bit different te habitat techniques or practices in each section to try to evaluate the species response. Um, so basically what we found, um, 2021 was our first year to evaluate this, um, that the proportion of brook trout dropped in all of the sections that we did habitat work on except for the middle section in which it remained similar to pre-project proportions, which in that case, I feel like that was a win because in all of our other projects um, or after a disturbance, brook trout have declined. So the fact that they actually held their own and stayed in similar abundance prior to project was, was a good sign. Um, and this is just um, some data from that sampling. So you can see here, this is um, number of fish per mile. These are before project numbers. So brown is rust, the orange color, and then the brook is green. Um, so brook trout were lower before. And then here's our three different sites that we sampled in 2021 with the different um, stream habitat practice in there. So you can see the middle site actually increased in brook trout, but also did brown trout. So, and then I threw this one up here on the right. This is the site on Plum Creek that has not had habitat work done. And we also see this huge dominant brown trout population here as well. So um, we really didn't expect brook trout to overtake brown trout here, but um, brook trout you know, are still higher than they were pre-project, um, which is encouraging. Um, so we're definitely, this is experimental. We're definitely learning from this, but I did wanna give you an update if you're familiar with this project. So my overall take homes, um, changes in species dominance, um, favoring brown trout. We've been noticing this on several of the streams. We're trying to discern why, and this is obviously not desirable in some of these streams because we have these important native brook trout resources that we need to try to conserve if we can. Um, it's not due to temperature or habitat work in particular. We do know that. Um, Right now, what I'm seeing is that any kind of disturbance, whether it be habitat work um, or drought or an extreme water level fluctuation um, or a fish kill, any of these could trigger um, that flip in species dominance. Um, but I feel like the underlying geology 
um, in the bedrock may be able to explain or predict these changes in species dominance um, following disturbance. So just for example, you know, say there's a major drought on one of these streams um, or there's a fish kill, um, that's the disturbance. And then brown trout just seem to take advantage um, of that um, disturbance where brook trout aren't able to um, sustain or take advantage of it. And brown trout numbers just tend to explode while brook trout decline. So that's basically what we're seeing. Um, we're definitely gonna continue to investigate these. Um, so with that, I will take any questions. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of this. I've given this talk a couple of times um, and I've changed some things around to try to um, make my point a little clearer because it's generated a lot of questions and a lot of dis discussion, which is good. So hopefully um, you guys enjoyed it and it wasn't too much. Um, but if you do have questions and I don't get them tonight, that's my email address that you can um, email me at. Well, thank you, Casey. Uh, you can leave your slides up if you want, or you can stop sharing your screen, whatever you prefer to do. Okay. Uh, we already have a number of questions in the chat that I'll read to you. Okay. And meanwhile, I'm sure uh, folks are gonna start asking questions. Uh, the first question is from Evan Griggs. Uh, and he's wondering how were or are brown trout getting into brook trout streams? Bucket yeah. biologists? question mark migrating from other streams question mark yeah great question i didn't touch on that um, because it's kind of a different story for each stream so pine creek um, it flows directly into the mississippi but a little bit upstream on the mississippi the rush flows in so i'm assuming that these fish um, that these brown trout in pine creek migrated out of the rush you know when the water was cold enough in the mississippi and then found pine creek and invaded from there. Um, Katy Creek is another, it's a whole other story and it's a long story, but Katy Creek um, is a tributary to the O'Galley River. Um, and in 2005, so the O'Galley is a class two and it's always been stocked with brown trout. However, they were um, historically stocked with domestic strain brown trout, hatchery brown trout. And in 2005, the stocking strain was changed um, from domestic to feral timber coolie strain, which are collected from down south near La Crosse. Um, so that different stocking strain, I feel, is what drove um, the timber coolie strain is a little bit more migratory, a little bit more robust, and they're able to um, better um, naturally reproduce in a lot of our streams. And after that, um, it was the next year and brown trout started showing up in Katy Creek after that stocking change. So it's a little bit different story for each of them. Parker is a trip to the Kinney, which you guys know is brown trout dominant. Um, so that's likely where they came from in some of those instances. But good question. Thank you, that's interesting. I'm glad to hear that Evan wasn't out there with a bucket dumping brown trout into a brook trout stream, at least as far as we know. Right, yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> and then casting the blame on somebody else. <laughs> but, but, sorry, but anyway, the next question is from uh, Tom Stowe. And his question is, might changing our brown trout fishing strategy from catch and release to catch and keep help restore the brook trout population? Yes. Another good question. I'm glad you brought that up. I just felt like I had too many things to talk about where I just couldn't talk about everything. But yes, um, so I changed the regulations in Pine and Katy a couple years ago to further liberalize brown trout harvest to allow people to keep more. Um, and then this coming um, season or spring hearings, I'm further liberalizing it in those two streams um, to let people keep five brown trout um, and brook trout catch and release only for the time being. Um, so yeah, if people wanna go to Pine and Katie and you know even Parker catch and keep the Browns, that would be awesome because in Katie we're removing them anyways um, and they're going to good use. Um, but if anglers can go down there and take advantage of them, that would be awesome. So yeah, definitely encourage harvest on these particular streams for Browns. Okay, excellent. Sounds like it's time for a, a fish fry. Yeah, it sounds good. So, and uh, I'm sorry, just a follow up question. Is it the, the larger browns 
taking those out is more beneficial than taking out smaller browns? Is that true in terms of brook trout or is it not matter? Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, in terms of like predation um, and spawning, um, taking those larger individuals out for the time being, that would probably um, probably be more advantageous than if you took a small one. But if you catch a small one, you know, if it's edible size, feel free to keep that too, so. <laughs> <laughs> <Great. laughs> okay, change the subject. This is a question from Philip Cashian. Have there been changes in aquatic insects over time? That's a really good question. And I wish I had a good answer for you. So I only um, survey the fish population. The aquatic insects and water quality is in a whole other department and they take care of sampling that. And they are generally very overstaffed for their management area. So a lot of these streams don't have good data um, or at least good trend data or annual data on the aquatic insect community. Um, so that's definitely somewhere where we're lacking and I really can't even speak to that because I'm not sure. I just don't have the data to say one way or the other. Um, but in terms of habitat, um, you know, between these streams where we've seen the species flip and we've seen them not flip, um, the substrate is very different. So Western Dunn County, like I said, is sandstone. Those are sand bottom streams. Um, that's a base. They're a little bit lower gradient, sandy. Um, and then you go into Pierce County and the substrate is totally different um, with the limestone and freestone streams. Um, so the, the aquatic insect, insect communities between those two, I'm sure are extremely different. Um, but whether that's changed you know, within those systems over time, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Okay, that sounds like uh, maybe an interesting question for some of the uh, TCTU stream keepers to try to answer if we get into looking at aquatic insects, but uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. The next question is uh, a, from uh, Petty. And it says it looks like both brook and brown trout declined significantly in Pine Creek in 2015. What happened? In 2000, in Pine Creek? Um, you might need to pull up your slide. Yeah, I can share it again, this one. So this is Pine, um, 2015. There's not really a decline there. I wonder if he was talking about a different stream. Um, but in general, one thing um, that I just didn't get a chance to talk to because it's you know a whole other deal is that 2011, 2012 was a huge drought year um, across this region. Um, and that's a lot of times where we have seen this change in species. Um, you can see Plum Creek, that's right about when brown trout became dominant here, for example, and brook trout just started to decline after that. So um, for Plum Creek and some of the other ones, I feel like that drought, um, it was very extreme, um, low water, very warm summer. Um, I feel like that's probably the disturbance, you know, that caused this initial change in species structure. But um, Pine Creek, I just, maybe he was talking about another stream. Feel free to unmute if you um, want to clarify, you know, what you're talking about or your question. Okay, if you'd like to unmute and clarify your question, that's great, or else you can ask it again in the chat. Yeah, um, for sure. I guess, meanwhile, I'll move on. Okay. The next question uh, from Philip Cashian is, uh, have you looked at either Cave Creek or Lost Creek? Yes. Um, yeah, so we monitor both of those annually, um, and those, that's, both of those are tributaries to the rush. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with those. Um, and those have had both species um, for decades. Um, and brown trout in both of those are slightly more dominant than brook trout, um, but brook trout are still in fairly high abundance in both of those streams. They're definitely not the dominant species and they're, they're lower in abundance than brown trout, but it is interesting um, because they, you know, historically were 
brook trout streams as well. Um, and that's, you know, all that was in there historically. So um, yeah, there's a little bit of flip there too to Browns, um, you know, and they're in Pierce County as well. Um, so, but brook trout are still somewhat holding their own in those streams, but brown trout are very dominant too. But yeah, good question. Cause those are a couple other streams where we haven't did any kind of habitat work there, but those streams still, you know, are experiencing the same like drought conditions and other um, environmental factors that the other streams are too, so. Okay, here's a question from Mark Nelson. Uh, have the cases where dominant brook trout been overtaken by brown trout occurred only following in-stream disturbance? Or are there cases where the change in dominance occurs without disturbance? So, so far in, in cases where they've changed um, in species dominance, um, we've been able to detect some kind of disturbance in those streams that likely caused the change. Like I said, this was, this is a theory, um, you know, as far as the geology goes, and we haven't tested that yet, but um, basically we can identify some kind of disturbance in each of the streams that have flipped. So um, Plum Creek, um, it's actually um, got a flowage um, above all of these, um, it's got a huge dam above all of these sites that we sample. So it's controlled by um, the dam operation. So um, with that one, when there was a drought year, you know, they obviously had to hold more water back in the lake. So um, water became very low in the stream, obviously warmer as well. So that was the disturbance there. Um, and then in these other streams, um, have, whether it was habitat work in conjunction with, you know, a drought or some other environmental um, disturbance, um, that's generally around the time period when these species dominance changed in these streams. So we can usually identify some kind of disturbance that occurred um, where the streams have changed. Um, and then there's other streams, um, like I mentioned, Gilbert and Wilson, um, they've also had the disturbance of major habitat work, but they haven't changed in species dominance, um, which is really interesting, which is why I have the theory of, um, you know, the bedrock can predict if there will be a change, um, but I don't, we don't know the mechanism that actually like causes um, brook trout to remain dominant or not. Um, so hopefully that <laughs> answers your question. It's kind of a long-winded response, but yeah, we've, we've detected disturbances in most of these streams, um, but some other streams that haven't flipped, um, you know, why, why is that? Okay, well, here's a question actually related to the bedrock from Don Kellett. He says, how does bedrock geology affect available food sources? Yeah, good question. Um, well, in, in terms of invertebrates, um, like I was saying earlier with the sandstone, like Wilson, Gilbert, um, you know, the lower part of South Fork of the Hay and most of the other streams in Western Dunn County where it's sandstone dominated geology, those are all sand bottom streams. There's very little gravel um, or rock substrates that you're gonna naturally find in those streams um, unless you go towards the headwaters area. Um, so that's obviously definitely gonna affect the food sources present in terms of uh, macro invertebrates um, with that sand dominated substrate. If you move into Pierce County, like I said, it's got the freestone, um, you know, very rocky gravel cobble substrate. Um, you know, think of the rush, for example. Um, most of those streams are Lost Creek, Cave Creek, most of those streams in that in that county with that limestone geology, um, um, the food sources for macroinvertebrates is gonna be very different from the sand dominated streams. So um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question there, but I'm sure that the, the, um, the insect populations are very different for the food sources. Okay, here's a question from somebody with a very cool name jclash.exo <laughs> sounds like a kind of a cognac but anyway uh, he says i've caught more brook trout in the rush over the past three years has the brook trout population increased there are they stocking 
Yeah, so that's interesting. I mean, generally, um, when people are fishing, brook trout are more easily caught than brown trout. But however, um, in our last survey in 2021, we surveyed the rush basically from top to bottom, um, you know, and comparing that to years past of brook trout um, abundance, brook trout were definitely in higher abundance than they had been um, for the past several years in the rush, um, which was cool to see, not that they were by any means, um, you know, getting close to the dominant species or in significantly higher abundance, but they were, um, there were a lot more brook trout than we've seen in the past several years. Um, no stocking in the rush or any of that entire watershed. Um, rush is a class one. We don't do any stocking in our class one streams because of um, natural reproduction in there. So no stocking. Those are all natural brook trout. Um, if you're in any kind of proximity to um, a smaller tributary, um, you're probably going to find higher numbers of brook trout around those um, or any kind of um, you know springs or groundwater upwellings, but particularly the smaller tributaries. If you're anywhere near those, you'll find higher numbers of brook trout generally. Well, that's good news. Uh, the next question is from Jim Souter. Uh, he said, I had a quote unquote survey on his windshield when fishing a Wisconsin stream. Was that your effort? And if so, any interesting observations? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, we were doing a creel survey um, this year. That was um, part of one of my projects that we were working on. So the survey actually came from my um, technician, Barb Scott, who basically was there every day handing out those survey cards. Um, and um, so we're in the middle of analyzing all that data and we'll have a report um, at the end of the winter um, that I can give out. So I don't have any, um, observations on that yet, but in about a month I will after I get um, done going through all of that data. So that's cool. I'm glad you were uh, I'm glad you were part of that. Um, I'm sure other people were too. Um, but that was just a one time one time deal. The rush hadn't been creeled or had a creel survey done in over 20 years. Um, so it's it'll be really good um, information that we get from that survey. Do you have any idea when the results will be ready? Yeah, um, in about, I would say a month or two, for sure, before our spring sampling starts, we'll have those reports done. Okay, well, we'll be interested in getting some sort of report, or maybe we can invite you and your colleague to come and, and talk to us again. Yeah, definitely. That would be awesome. And like I said, we sampled the rush um, fishery last year in, entire, in its entirety. So I'll have a huge report for that as well to go along with the creel survey. Excellent. So the next question is from Chris O'Brien. Uh, would the DNR ever consider a mandatory catch and keep regulation for brown trout in certain streams, similar to the regulations in Yellowstone National Park to protect cutthroats? Yeah, that's a good question. It, we don't have a mandatory catch and keep anywhere in the state. And from my understanding, it's not, um, it's not in our toolbox of regulations to put on streams right now, so we we can't implement that currently. Um, if we if we did create a new regulation like that, it would have to go through a bunch of approval processes. Um, but it is pretty interesting because I am familiar with um, Yellowstone and the Cuddies out there. Um, so and it it would also be a little bit hard to enforce catch and keep, um, but and I don't know how popular it would be either because we have to go through, um, you know, so much public input to get these regulations put on streams. But if I could, I would because I think it would help out a lot um, and actually, you know, let anglers um, take out the fish, you know, that they can um, as well. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. Here's another question, which is pretty closely related to the last couple of questions. It says, we have been seeing brown trout size dropping in the rush, and we've also been seeing some brook trout. About one out of every 10 fish is a brook trout. Uh, is that what you are observing? And I assume that they mean what you're observing with your, um, you with know, with surveys. your um, sampling, with your electric. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so... 
No, that's not what we've seen other than one station. Um, one station, um, we did see a drop in the size structure of Browns. Um, we sampled 14 stations. So only one station did we observe that. Um, the rest of the stations, we actually saw an increase in the size structure of brown trout. Um, there were higher abundances of fish of all size classes in every station except that one. Um, so I'd be curious to see where exactly on the rush you were fishing, if that lined up with what we saw. Um, but brook trout, like I said, brook trout are higher than they have been, but definitely not at a one to 10 ratio. Um, it's probably, you know, on a scale of 100, it's probably, oh, it's low for brook trout. I would guess like five to 10 brook trout for a hundred brown trout. So very, very low numbers of brook trout. Um, but like I said, people, people tend to catch more brook trout even when they're very in very low numbers than brown trout. So that's interesting. Okay. I, I'm having a, a hard time keeping up with the questions. When I started, there were four unanswered <laughs> questions and now there's 10, but we'll keep going. Okay, sounds uh, good. So this is a, a question from Matt. And it says, some of the catch per effort for brown trout seem really high, like 10,000 fish per mile is a huge number of fish. Is this density playing a significant role in the size of these fish? Yes, definitely. 10,000 fish per mile is crazy, especially for a stream the size of Pine Creek. Um, it was insane. It took us our station there was um, only 276 meters long, um, but it took us most of the day to get through all of those fish that we sampled within that stretch. Um, so it was crazy. Um, and is this density playing a role in the size of these fish? For sure. Um, I talk about it all the time. So trout and pretty much um, many fish species are highly what we call density dependent. So there's only so many so much resources in a stream or water body to go around. Um, so when there's more trout, they're all competing for the same resources. So that's obviously affecting their growth rates. So, and fish can actually stunt when that occurs, when there's enough fish to compete with each other where they're not really growing at all just because there's not enough food for everybody to grow at adequate rates. Um, so definitely that's a huge role in a lot of trout populations, um, especially on Pine Creek, they're overly abundant. In 2020, 2021, um, they were, um, those were great years for natural reproduction. So they had huge year classes during the past couple years, which drove a lot of that 10,000 fish per mile. So most of the fish, I would say, um, I have the number, it's like 88 or 90% of the fish in Pine Creek were less than eight inches long browns um so very poor size structure because there's just so many of them and they had those huge year classes so for sure okay interesting uh the next question is from paul algren uh, how does a large rain event change the ph of streams for example yeah. high water high ph low water low ph or how, how does it affect it 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 depends so we don't i don't manage or um, sample pH or water quality when we're doing our sampling. We have a whole other department that does that. Um, but when these rain events come, it really depends on where you are in the watershed and the land use um, practices that are around you in conjunction with, you know, the bedrock geology and the soils of the area. So it depends, you know, what that water is running through before it reaches the stream. Um, whether it be high or low pH, um, you know, it can depend on, you know, point or non-point source pollution that can influence pH. So we, when we get rain events, all of that goes into the stream at that particular location. But as it gets farther down in the watershed, um, it obviously gets diluted. Um, so you might not see that change in pH, you know, all the way through the watershed, depending on you know, the land use around the areas as well, because that influences a lot of the pH and the water quality um, during these rain events. Okay. 
Uh, the next question is from Larry, and he's wondering if you've seen the same thing with the um, changes in dominant species after uh, disturbance in other parts of Wisconsin, for example, in the Kickapoo area. Yeah, for sure. So that one slide I threw up there um, was from the biologist down in La Crosse. Um, it was Plum Creek in Crawford County. He's also seen this um, on a few of his other streams down there. Um, and he's also doing a brown trout removal project on one of the streams down there as well. So yes, it it's happened on other streams in other districts as well. I unfortunately have several streams where it's happening. And the, the ones I talked about in the presentation are just um, a few of the fishable sized waters or streams that this has happened on. There's some other smaller streams that I didn't talk about that this has also happened as well. So um, yes, definitely in, in other areas. Um, and um, around the country too, I've got um, some studies and some manuscripts that I've read where this has happened as well too in other states, so. I, uh, this question is from Mark Nelson, it says it looks like annual summer temperatures have been quite stable over many years. I think he means water temperatures. Could there be short duration peak temperatures within seasons that exceed the thermal maximum for brook trout? Peaks that are masked by the average summer temperature. Yes, definitely. Um, and that's one thing that I found with Plum Creek in Pierce County after going back and looking through historical data, looking at peaks um, and in, um, I forget what year, it was like, it was around 2011, 2012 we, where we had that drought um, and the peak temperature during that summer got extremely high, likely above the thermal maximum for brook trout. Um, the thermal maximum for brown trout is very similar, but it's just a little higher than brookies. Um, so they were likely able to withstand that a little better and bounce back from it better than brook trout. So yes, um, totally agree that that's likely what happened um, in Plum Creek and maybe some of the other streams as well. So. Okay, that's interesting. What's the old joke that you know, if you got your feet in the furnace and your head in the freezer, on average, you're perfect. Perfect temperature. <laughs> the average. <Yeah>. Yep. <laughs> All right. Anyway, Christy Simmons wants to know, are there any habitat restoration techniques that have been identified um, as specifically detrimental to the brook trout population? Yeah, so that's kind of what I talked about. Um, with our traditional habitat techniques um, and some of the structures that have always been used in those projects, for example, lunker structures, when we're doing our stream surveys, um, generally a few large brown trout come out of those structures. So they really dominate that type of overhead cover. Um, so obviously, um, you know, they're out competing brook trout for that optimal place um, or that optimal habitat. So we haven't been using as much overhead cover in a lot of the streams um, that both pop that both brook and brown trout occur in and where we're trying to manage for brook trout. So we've kind of gone away with those um, and we've moved towards um, you know that complex woody habitat that I've talked about with um, the root wads and then more um, island habitats to try to increase um, you know, sinuosity um, and increase, you know, the number of microhabitats that brook trout, you know, could occupy and not have to like compete with brown trout for um, the same habitat or the same channel. Um, so definitely we've seen in these habitat projects, we're, it, we're great at making adult brown trout habitat with these projects. So that's why when I talked about it at the end there, what we were um, experimenting with on Plum Creek, and I didn't get into it in very much detail just because I felt like I was taking up a lot of time, but that's what we're experimenting with to try to identify if um, there are habitat practices we can use in our projects that will actually promote brook trout um, that they can take advantage of and where brown trout can't. So we're, we're working on that, but we have identified some that um, brook trout just can't compete for with brown trout. So. Well, we're looking forward to seeing more results from that Plum Creek and hope that you 
uh, can find, you know, effective habitat uh, techniques for brook trout. Uh, here's a question from Carl Nelson. Uh, does heavy rip wrapping influence pH or is it mainly the spring inflow? He says lower Pine Creek is actually within the Jordan sandstone, but the springs percolate down through the overlying dolomite. Right. Exactly. So the rip wrapping generally, I don't think that we put in enough or do long enough sections of rip wrap or habitat work to influence the overall pH of the entire stream. Um, so it may, you know, if we did, you know, entire stream sections, it may be enough to where it could influence it. But right now, um, you know, where we can only work on, you know, easements that are generally you know, about 3,000 feet long um, at a time. I just don't think that's enough to influence the pH. Um, so it's it's mostly um, spring inflow. Um, and yeah, he's actually correct. That showed on my map too. Um, the lower part of pine is in the sandstone. Um, and then the upstream headwaters area is in that dolomite um, bedrock geology. So um, with Pine Creek, we haven't actually, like I said, this is a theory, we haven't tested it yet. Um, we've got our water, water quality folks um, that are hopefully going to be looking into the pH um, and any changes that might occur in these streams. So it's definitely something that we're testing out. Um, you know, how long of section does um, it take to, you know, change pH if you're altering um, the banks, you know, with riprap or um, with the upstream headwaters of Pine Creek, for example, within that Dolomite area, similar to Wilson Creek um, in Dunn County, it's got a very similar situation where the headwaters very far up are have a little bit of Dolomite um, in them, and then it flows down into sandstone for the majority of the stream. Um, so yeah, it's interesting um, why those changes are, but generally um, we don't know what length of a section causes you know, changes in pH, if any. Hmm. Okay. And here's the, oh, I thought it was the last question, but it's the second to last question from the well-known trophy carp angler, Evan Griggs. He asks, what other fish species do you find on surveys in these streams? Smallmouth, carp, pike, sculpins, any population data on these species in conjunction with trout? Good question. So, most of these streams, Kinney, Rush, pretty much any stream in Pierce County, um, and even Wilson, or not Wilson, Western Dunn County, um, strictly trout streams. They're just too cold to support um, smallmouth carp. Um, we do get a few pike if you're down in the lower part of some of the watersheds. Um, they're usually super small, um, but it's mostly trout and sculpins um, and some lampreys. Um, so very low species diversity just because the water is so cold in most of these streams. You get a little bit warmer water, you're going to get more diversity. Um, so I unfortunately don't have any of these typical trout streams to point you in the direction toward if you're headed for smallmouth, um, you could try the apple. The apple is an outstanding smallmouth stream. Um, it's bigger, warmer. There's only one little section that's um, trout water. Um, definitely good smallmouth there. Carp, got a bunch of lakes and I cover the St. Croix River and the Red Cedar as well. Um, it definitely could target carp there, but generally in these trout streams, all we're seeing is trout, sculpins, um, a few maybe minnow species, um, and some darters here and there, um, and dace. So that's basically what we're seeing in most of them. Okay. Evan knows some places in the Twin Cities metro where you can go after carp. So anyway, nice. I, here's a question from Jim Nelson. He says, off topic, but do you have an update on the health of the lower kinney after the drawdown? Yes, I do. Um, so we surveyed the kinney at Glen Park. So um, if you're familiar at the mouth of Rocky Branch is where we start. This is, we survey that every year. It's one of our trend sites. Um, so we've got really good data for that site. Um, so we surveyed that last year in 2021, um, along with a site upstream of the dam. Um, which is at the Aldi's parking lot, Highway 3565. 
um, if you're familiar with that. Um, so we surveyed those two sites last year. Um, and honestly and surprisingly, Glen Park, the Glen Park area by Rocky Branch looked outstanding and probably definitely a better size structure than it's ever had. Natural reproduction was very high. Um, we saw a good year class from the previous year in 2020 as well. So it it honestly looked very good. Trout numbers um, were higher there than they were at the site upstream of River Falls um, at the Aldi's parking lot. So it looked really, really good. Um, we're gonna sample it again this year along with a site in Old Empowment um, as well, so. That's great to hear. This is my chance to get on the soapbox a little bit about the Powell Falls Dam and the former Lake Louise impoundment that has been drawn down. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to be kicking off a big fundraising effort together with Kiaptuish. Uh, the dam is going to be taken out within the next 12 months, and most of that will be uh, paid for by public funding. Uh, but we do need to raise money to restore that stretch of the river. And uh, if you've ever gone up there after they drew down the water, you'll see it's got you know high banks and lots of issues, but the bones of the stream are amazing. Just great riffle pool sequences and uh, just right in practically in downtown River Falls. So it's a, it's a very exciting opportunity for us. And I'm, I'm glad the trout populations are doing well in the Lower Kinney. Yes, for sure. It was encouraging to see. We're also gonna sample further down at County F um, this coming year to try to see what's going on that far down there as well. Okay, so getting off the soapbox now, we have a question from Ernie Stack. Uh, will your research be available on a website? So um, as far as like our reports um, for our stream surveys um, and our specific projects, unfortunately now they're not. Um, um, we've got staff that are working on getting all of these um, recent reports onto our website where people can easily access them, but right now they're not. So you will have to um, get a hold of me, email me is the easiest way, and I can send um, all of our reports to you. Okay, and a uh, question from Mark Nelson. Are the Browns under large lunker structures large enough to be predating brook trout? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, that was kind of just a general statement where we find a few large brown trout under um, or in the lunker structures. Um, and generally, you know, they're very large dominant brown trout. Um, usually, you know, fish over 15 inches, you know, there's some small ones mixed into, but generally we pull out some really big brown trout from those structures um, that are definitely big enough to prey on brook trout for sure. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we don't have any questions at this point from the chat. Do any of, uh, I see that Eve has a question. What okay. About, with the browns and the brook, has she seen a lot of tiger trout? Oh, uh, Eve's question is with the, the, the great populations of brown and brook trout in this area, do you see a lot of tiger trout? Um, we see occasional tiger trout, um, you know, maybe one here in this survey and then one here in this other stream in a survey. But this year um, was kind of our record for tiger trout um, that we surveyed. So we surveyed upwards of 90 sites this year on streams across all these two and a half counties. Um, and I think we got nine tiger trout this year um which was higher than in, we've ever sampled in these streams so um and we caught some some larger ones that we had seen in the past too so yeah higher numbers of tiger trout this year but like Very i said cool. we only caught nine you know and out of out of, 90, out of what was the end Ten thousand like, or something right <laughs> pine creek we didn't catch any <laughs> so the number of fish that we handled <laughs> oh gosh it's probably over a hundred thousand Trout. And nine tiger trout. Nine tiger trout, yeah. So very low. <laughs> so, They're here and there. Okay. Other questions from the studio audience? Yeah, does she know about Osceola Creek? That one that she's monitored? I know that's had, I've 
Brook trout in there? Barton is asking if you know anything about Osceola Creek. He says he's caught brook trout there. Yeah, I don't. That's in Polk County, which is just out of my area. Um, and the biologist up there was Aaron Cole. He just accepted a supervisor position, um, but um, he could still help you out with your with your question. Um, Aaron I Cole. Just, Aaron Cole. Okay. Other questions. Yes. She was talking about below the dam. It's right uh, in Glen Park. It's, I don't know, about a mile below the dam, maybe not quite a mile. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Yeah. So um, I've been very impressed by the questions that people have. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. And they're very, um, very scientific and very curious. Uh, I tend to like to catch fish. And I, if possible, I like to catch bigger fish. So, uh, so I guess I have two questions for you. The first question is, uh, are any of these uh, efforts you're doing to increase brook trout populations having any impact on brook trout size? And secondly, if I were going off to try to catch brook trout over 12 inches, do you have any Without giving away any state secrets, do you have any any <laughs> hints for me? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yes, um, Katy Creek in particular. So Katy, we're doing brown trout removal, changing the regulations. I'm moving brook trout from the headwaters down to the areas where they've been depleted. Um, so in there, um, tr trout in general are fairly low abundance right now because we're doing all of these changes um so in there we're definitely going to see some increases in probably the size structure of brook trout um because we're taking out the browns and there's a few brook trout left and so they're going to have a ton of you know food resources available to them so they're probably going to grow really well um so I wouldn't say try Katie because we're trying to conserve the brook trout population there, but I would head to Northern Dunn County if you want to catch a brookie over 12. Um, South Fork of the Hay is a good one to try. Okay, that's good to hear. I view a 12 inch brook trout as basically being in the same, same, same class uh, trophy wise as a 20 inch brown. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Okay. Are there any other questions? I'm starting to see some comments coming in. Nicely done. Thank you. Many thanks for such an interesting presentation. Really great. Awesome. You're just a real underachiever, aren't you, Casey? <laughs> well, thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to you guys again. Um, hopefully next time it can be in person. But yeah, thank you all so much. All right. Well, thank you to everybody for uh, uh, showing up on a cold winter night, either from your home or the, 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 the folks who came out here to the Crooked Pint. Uh, our next meeting will be on March 22nd. Uh, I'm actually very excited about this because we have a, a, um, a gentleman named Ron Miller who has been fishing the Strait River uh, in north central Minnesota for 30 plus years. And he knows everything there is to know about fishing the hex hatch, uh, which is, you know, just this amazing huge mayfly that hatches in unbelievable numbers. So, uh, so at any rate, I, we may see you at Great Waters, and then we hope to see you at our next chapter meeting. And thank you to everybody, and thank you, Casey. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. I see all the chats. Thank you. Thank you.